this course of lectures is on the Second Vatican Council, the central and most important event in Catholic history in the 20th century. This first lecture is going to be the background of the Council, what the situation of the Church was uh, on the eve of the Council, what the circumstances were under which it was summoned, uh, what it was expected to do. Uh, then in, in subsequent lectures we will examine what it actually did do and we'll also spend some time on the aftermath of the Council and attempting to assess uh, to what extent the Council, you might say, met its expectations uh, and uh, to what extent perhaps it did not. Now, by uh, most measurable criteria uh, in the late 1950s, the Catholic Church would have to be thought to be in uh, very good health. If we were to take the United States as an example, uh, the Church was in a flourishing state. Uh, the rate of Church attendance was very high. Uh, there was an abundance of religious vocations. Catholics in America, even though they had been poor and immigrants for the most part, had succeeded in building a great parish system. Most parishes had a, a school. We had a great high school system. We had a college system. Um, by, as I say, any measurable criteria, anything that lends itself to statistics, uh, the church was in healthy state. I think also that those who had their finger on the pulse of the church at the time uh, would have said that it was uh, spiritually healthy as well people were devout. People were genuinely trying to live up uh, to the teachings of the church. They were, of course, sinners. They were, of course, people who, who failed. They had their blind spots. But uh, on the whole, they took their faith very seriously. And uh, insofar as they understood that faith, uh, they tried to live it. And I think the same was true most other places in the Catholic world. The 20th century has of course been a great missionary age and so in the end, at the end of the 1950s the church was growing rapidly in Asia and Africa. It was soon ceasing to be a predominantly Western church and other parts of the world were, were just as important in the Catholic scheme of things. Europe, Western Europe had of course been the traditional heart of the church, where the church, although founded in Palestine, uh, first really took root in Europe. Now here, perhaps, uh, the prognosis wasn't quite as good. There were Western European countries, we could mention Ireland perhaps, maybe Spain, where um, levels of church attendance, levels of devotion and so forth were also extremely high. But uh, in some countries, and perhaps France was the most notable example, uh, leaders of the church were rather worried by what they saw as measurable decline. There, the rate of church attendance was lower. It seemed to be getting lower all the time. Uh, there was a sense that uh, many of the people of France, although they remained nominally Catholic, had... Uh, really, the faith had, faith had really ceased to mean a great deal to them in their personal lives. Uh, one French bishop, for example, had actually written a, an encyclical letter shortly after, a pastoral letter shortly after the Second World War, uh, with the rather sensational question as its title, France, pagan? Uh, meaning that if things keep going the way they are, uh, France will cease to be a Christian nation and may be viewed as pagan. Now, the office of the papacy was also at a very high level in terms of prestige and authority in the late 1950s. In 1939, Pope Pius XII had been elected. He had come to the papal throne as a highly experienced Vatican diplomat. He had spent a number of years in Germany during the very troubled times. Uh, he became the Papal Secretary of State. He had traveled widely. No one else knew the 
situation of the universal church nearly as well as he did. And he had a relatively long reign, 19 years. And he was a man of aristocratic birth, aristocratic bearing. He was tall and austere. He was the sort of man who automatically commanded deference, respect, even perhaps a bit of awe, uh, without necessarily having to explicitly command it. It was very easy to see Pius XII as the Vicar of Christ, uh, the most important, perhaps, of all the papal titles. And in those days, following a very ancient tradition, when the Pope entered St. Peter's Basilica uh, for formal ceremonies, he was carried in a chair, which was borne on the shoulders of some rather burly men uh, as a sign of his exalted office. And he wore on these occasions what was called the triple crown uh, because it had three different levels uh, reflecting the various uh, authorities or rules, uh, kingdoms you might say, uh, which the Pope uh, could exercise. So when Pius XII died in 1958, uh, I think that any objective assessment of the church would have said he left it in very good hands. Uh, it, it was in a flourishing condition. And it had successfully weathered uh, some uh, rather serious storms. Somewhat uh, to the surprise of uh, perhaps most people, the man who was elected pope in 1958 is very different in character from Pius XII. He is Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, Patriarch of Venice, who in a way, uh, the only things that he had in common with Pius XII uh, of any real significance were that they were both Italian and that John XXIII, as he became known, uh, had also spent a good part of his life in the papal diplomatic service, as had Pius XII. John XXIII, uh, as he never forgot and never hesitated to remind people, had been born into a peasant family in northern Italy, not into a, an aristocratic family like his predecessor. And uh, whereas Pius XII, as we said, was tall and austere, John XXII was short and uh, indeed quite fat. Uh, Paul, uh, Pius XII had about him this almost intimidating air of authority. John XXIII seemed to uh, deliberately cultivate a much more informal image. He smiled a lot, he laughed a lot, he joked with people. Many of his jokes were sort of at his own expense. He did not pretend to be an intellectual. He was in fact a good deal smarter and more learned than he appeared to be, but uh, he preferred if people thought of him as the simple uh, peasant uh, who by some inexplicable means had risen high in the church. He had done parish work in the north of Italy. He had been secretary to a bishop. He had then, as I said, entered the papal diplomatic service, and uh, he had served mostly out of Europe in places like Turkey and Bulgaria where he got to know something about uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and about Islam. And then after World War II was made the papal nuncio or ambassador to France, which was a very difficult position because the French government was very upset at the fact that they said uh, some of the French bishops had actively cooperated with the Germans during the war. So Cardinal or Archbishop Roncalli was sent to Fr France to handle a very touchy situation. And by everyone's uh, agreement, he handled it very well. Then he is rewarded in the normal course in which ba successful Vatican diplomats are rewarded by being made Patriarch of Venice uh, and then a short time later a Cardinal. And then in 1958, as I said, to the surprise of many, he is elected pope. 